Let's go. Call the order. Uh, roll call. Councilmember Agency Director Mann. Present. Marcus. Here. Cilio. Is here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chairman Smith. Here. Mayor Chairman Paris. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. So does everybody like the sign? Looks beautiful, doesn't it? Yes. Good job. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Pastor Jerry Fursa, are you going to lead us in prayer? And let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. And Father, we thank you for our nation. We thank you for the liberties that we enjoy as Americans. And Father, we do pray for our troops, that you would continue to watch over them and bring them home safely. And Lord, we thank you for the fight of freedom. And Lord, we do pray that you bless their families. And Lord, we thank you for our city. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy here in Lancaster. We thank you for the tremendous job that our mayor and, and council members are doing. And Lord, I pray that you would give each of them wisdom. Fathers, they work together, Lord, to, to better this community. And, Lord, I pray that you'd have your hand upon this city. And, Lord, I pray that you'd bless this meeting now. May you give wisdom and guidance. And we ask this now in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Mr. Cilio, you want to lead the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, have a seat. <laughs> Just the one presentation? Yes. You want to help us out with that? <laughs> Mayor Bob Green will... Uh, oh, great. Yeah. Great. This is Parks and Recreation, Parks, Recreation, and Arts Month, right? right? And I could read all the whereases, but I think what we really want to tell you is that we love our parks, and we love the job you guys are doing. And if there's, you know, we do a lot of good things in this city, but what you guys do improves all of our lives. And we want to thank you. We appreciate that. Let's get the sign. Come over here. That's good. Right, Are you taking care of the walkers this week? Okay. Okay, good. I've been gone, so I wanted to be sure. <sighs> City manager, do you have anything to be removed? No, sir. Good. And uh, on the consent calendar, anybody have anything they want to have taken off? Want to pull? I have items 10, 12. Anything else? I uh, um, yeah. should consider the agency consent calendar first, and I believe you want yes. to CC2. Oh. oh, I got ahead of myself, didn't I? The CC2. So it's just CC2? Mm -hmm. yeah. That needs to be pulled. RCC2. Okay, so we pull that, and then we do the, we approve the others, and then we go back to that? Okay, good. I move that we adopt uh, the, um, the redevelopment consent calendar as uh, currently constituted. Is there a second? I'll second that. Let's vote. And it's unanimous. As to item number two, I'll move that we uh, adopt. Uh, do, I have to, sorry. do I have to leave, or I can just abstain on that? You have to give your reasons why you're. I mean, just only because we haven't gone through it to see if there's any uh, anything within 500 feet of what we own, and so because I have not done that yet, I'll be abstaining. 
So, there, I mean, there's a possibility that it does. Good. And whether we adopt RCC 2? I'll second that. Second. That's fine. Good. Uh, the mayor has abstained, and it was 4 0. Now we get to the consent calendar. Right? Yes. And what do we need to remove to, to pull on that? I believe you wanted to pull CC 10 and 12, and I don't know if there's speaker cards for any other item. Uh, we have no speaker cards on any other CA items. Last CC chance. Cards. Anybody want to get one in? Okay. No speaker cards. Uh, with the exception of CC 10 and CC 12, is there a motion? I move that we uh, adopt the uh, consent calendar as currently constituted. Is there a second? I'll second it. Next vote. It's unanimous. As to 10 and 12, uh, I'll be recusing myself because of a possible conflict. It's because of a potential impact, potential impact on a source of income. Um, I'm sorry, say that again. It's a potential impact on a source of income. The parties involved may have, may have been uh, clients I, I, and or defendants in a lawsuit. Yeah, on 12, the, the, the parties are, one of the par parties is, is a client. And on 10, uh, there was an indication to me that they were a party somewhere along the line, and I'm just not quite sure which. Okay? That's fine. Thanks. Vice Mayor, you want to take over? I guess. Okay, do I have any motions on CC 10 and 12? I move that we adopt CC 10 and CC 12. Do I have a second? Second. Go ahead and vote. It's unanimous with Mayor Paris for these reasons. Reflect that the mayor's back in, and I'm handing over the meeting back to the mayor. Thank you. Let's open the public hearings. Public hearing item number one, we'll hear from Randy Williams, Public Works Director. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, uh, from time to time, we bring to you actions that are proposed to annex additional properties into one of the benefit assessment districts. This evening, the first item before you in public hearing number one pertains to the drainage benefit assessment district where we have six different properties um, that are at various stages of development, but as a condition of those developments and at request of those property owners, um, they have, have asked that they be annexed into the drainage maintenance district. Each case, the developers will be making improvements that will require uh, maintenance of those facilities. And by virtue of their requesting to be annexed, uh, they will also then be assessed as others are assessed for their contribution towards that maintenance activity. Uh, staff has received all of the necessary documents as required by normal procedures and uh, verifies that they are in order and annexation, if the council so approves, is uh, ready to go forward. Staff res recommends then that the adoption of resolution 08-68 be effected and we can move forward. If there are questions, so I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. City Clerk, do you have any communications? No communications. Any speaker cards? Uh, no speaker's cards, uh, Mr. Mayor. Let's close the public hearing. Discussion? Motion? I may I move that we uh, adopt resolution number 0868. I'll second that. Let's vote. And it's unanimous. Public hearing item number two. We will 
You're still there. Thank you, sir. I won't go through that long speech again, but just to say that in this action, we're looking at the Lancaster Lighting Maintenance District. Five of those properties that were annexed in the last action to the Drainage Maintenance District are now being proposed for annexation in the Lighting Maintenance District, the sixth one having previously been annexed in by action of a council. Um, if there are no questions, staff would recommend the adoption of Resolution 08-69. Any questions? No questions for staff. Any communications? No communications. Any speaker cards? No speaker cards, Mr. Mayor. Let's uh, make a motion or a discussion. Uh, I'll move that we adopt resolution number 08-69. I'll second that. And it's unanimous. Well, I guess I should let them. Public hearing item number three. We'll hear from Elizabeth Brubaker, our housing director. Good evening, Mayor Paris and City Council members. Before you tonight is a resolution approving the issuance of tax-exempt revenue bonds to be utilized to finance the Arbor on Date project in downtown Lancaster. The bonds will be tax-exempt private activity bonds and therefore for the purpose of the Internal Revenue Code require the approval of the elected body of the governmental entity having jurisdiction over the area where the project to be financed is located. The city will not be under any obligation to repay the bond indebtedness from other than amounts paid by the borrower. The debt will not be secured by any form of taxation or by any obligation of the city. Neither will the debt represent or constitute a general obligation of the city. The debt would be repayable solely from amounts received pursuant to the terms and provisions of financing, agreements to be executed by the developer of the proposed project. In the financing documents, the developer will also provide comprehensive indemnification to city and its members. On July 24, 2007, the City Council adopted the resolution to apply for and receive an allocation of four million of home funds from the California Department of Housing Community Development for Arbor on Date, a 40-unit multifamily workforce housing project located at 44927 Date Avenue in downtown Lancaster to be built, owned, and operated by Urban Renewal LP. On January 11, 2008, the City was notified that the application submitted was successful for the award of home funds. The Arbor on Date represents another opportunity to kick off the effort to further make over downtown Lancaster through cooperative venture with private development interests in the downtown to create mixed uses urban villages of the 21st century where people live, work, and play and conserve on valuable natural resources. The success of this project is very important to the interests of the city. Please adopt resolution number 0870, approving the issuance of multifamily housing revenue bonds by the City of Lancaster in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $7 million to assist in the financing of the construction of Arbor on Date in the City of Lancaster. Uh, you got to wait for questions. <sighs> Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any communications? No communications. Any speaker cards? No speaker's cards, Mr. Mayor. Let's close the public hearing. And discussion or motion? I move that we adopt resolution number 08-70. I'll, I'll second that motion. Let's vote. Units unanimous. Moving on to new business. We will now hear the staff report from the finance director, Barbara Boswell, regarding the appointment of an audit representative. That sounds ominous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It'll be fun, really. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. <laughs> Whenever I get audited, it costs me money. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who does your taxes? This is probably a little more fun than that. Um, there is a new audit uh, standard that requires more communication than what we previously had from our audit committee with what they term those in governance, which happens to be our mayor and city council. There are various ways to accomplish that, and what we recommend is that the council appoint a representative to meet with the auditors 
probably two to three times per year and then report back to um, the City Council on any issues or um, items that are discussed in those meetings. And so with that, I will re would request that you would... Um, Is there any urgency to it? Uh, we, our fiscal year does end June 30th, and so we are getting ready to begin our audit. And um, so... Well, you, you know how sensitive the press is about appointing people without giving them a lot of notice beforehand. So how do I do, how do I accomplish this? Um, this would be not unlike other council committees where you have appointed a council person to a, a committee to represent the city. So well, I, I think so too, but you're not the one they're writing about on the front page every time you, I think about doing something. There would be no issue if you wanted to postpone this to the next meeting. Okay, so it's clear I will appoint uh, Vice Mayor Ron Smith to this, and if anybody wants to discuss that, they can do so at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. And we'll now hear from uh, city our city attorney, Dave McEwen, on new business item number two. I think you're going to hear from the city manager. Oh. This is the introduction of the ordinance uh, establishing the Lancaster Criminal Justice Commission at the direction of the council a couple of meetings back. Um, as you know, there will be a second reading of this as well, too. Just a brief, uh, brief commentary. Um, we've got after direction from the council, I met with the, the chairs that the council had appointed with the sheriff's captain and with representatives from the sheriff's department. And I think we've come up with a framework uh, where this commission will really help the community and help engage and leverage citizen involvement. We've already got a lot of that. I think this commission will help even more in that regard. Uh, once the committee is, a commission is established and members appointed, uh, they will go through a training process and will also then work on a work program, goals, etc. And with that, I'd be able, happy to answer any questions, as would our city attorney. Any questions? Tell us about the training program. Um, the training program, normally the Sheriff's Department has a 12-week training program. They would take a three-week training program, condense it to probably one day each week. They would learn what law enforcement does. They'd go through the laser village. Uh, they would learn some things about the law, probable cause, how to make arrests, etc. cetera. Um, this is a training program that the Sheriff's Department has offered off and on for elected officials. This would be a condensed version of that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any speaker cards? Uh, yes. Okay. This, this card actually is going to be on two entry. They just filled out one card to save it for the next report. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bozzigi. Any communications? No, okay. And Mr. Ivara? That was for next one, sir. Okay. So you're good on this one? Yeah. I just missed, missed it. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? We'll close the public hearing. Any discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll move that we uh, introduce ordinance number 904. Second that. And it's unanimous. Now we'll hear on uh, new business item number three from uh, Mr. Randy Williams. I think I was going to start on that, though. You're supposed to start on that? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. okay. We decided later. Um, Mr. McEwen, could we, um, would this be the appropriate time to strike some of the language that we want now so that it, it might affect any of the speakers? Or uh, we yes, I, I think that would be an appropriate thing okay. to do at this point. Yeah. Just a little introduction before Mr. Williams uh, speaks. This is something that, you know, go ahead. I want to make sure they're hearing you. Can you hear me okay there? Uh, this is something that I put on, you know, as everybody knows, the governor um, declared a drought. And we wanted to have been working with staff for several weeks now on getting an ordinance at least started, an emergency ordinance. We had a consensus from the council to move forward on this, mostly to take care of some of the basic things that other communities already do on a regular basis uh, to just start conserving water. And that's why we, um, uh, we brought this forward. Um, there's some of the language that, uh, that is now in the 
ordinance uh, before you that we're going to strike for various reasons. Uh, Mr. McEwen, uh, what was the, we're on uh, the first line where we get a strike during periods of water supply shortage on the first line? That's, that's correct. I, I think the ordinance itself covers two situations, wasting water at any time, which is under section .030, and then .040 section deals with uh, actions that might constitute a waste of water uh, during water, times of water shortage. So I think the, the use of the phrase in, the, in section 0. Point, or 010 um, right. at the end of the first line and carrying over to the second line, the words during periods of water supply shortage, I think that should come out of that, that section because right. it, that would exclude the section 030. So we're going to strike that. There's a number of other things that I'm going to um, – that we're going to strike out here. I talked to the city attorney after reading it. The fine, you know, we've gone through several iterations of this ordinance, you know, working things out and trying to make it pretty clear. Uh, one of the things that always bothers me sometimes in the law, and, and these are good items to have in, but they're not regulatory. They're instructional, and so we need uh, the city attorney agrees with me to strike them. On uh, section um, uh, 030 on subsection C, the line that says help from nearby customers or passerby is requested to report such leaks to the appropriate public water utility or to the city. Um, I'm going to ask that the city attorney maybe incorporate these things that we're going to strike into a explanation type section of the ordinance so that, because this is not regulatory, this is sort of suggest, suggestions of, of how to conduct business. Uh, also on subsection A, uh, everything after 6 p.m. It has instructions on what's the best way to water your lawn and water at cooler temperatures and everything. That's not regulatory. That's instructional. Uh, sub, uh, that's on section uh, 040, subsection A. On the same section, subsection B, uh, after water drain on the first sentence, it says hoses that are fitted. And then the continuing of the whole paragraph, that will be stricken also and moved to another section so that that way the, peop the, the citizens can have those instructions, but they're not confused as being regulatory. Uh, I'd also, on subsection C, we had discussed it, we wanted to add exempting windows. It says washing your house down. Well, I think everybody needs to wash their windows, and if they do it appropriately, that would be fine. So that would be how um, we'd want to present the ordinance at this time with those, uh, those changes. And uh, Mr. Williams, thank you. Yes, sir. Are there any questions? <laughs> You know, I, I would like you to briefly tell the folks just how dire this situation is and why this is necessary. Um, as I think most in the community have probably had opportunity at least to read in the newspaper or hear on um, local TV station or channels or programs or whatever, there are really two things that are occurring in the valley and have been ongoing for some time that, uh, three things that have been ongoing for some time that are affecting the available water supplies for all of us and anyone who may come into our presence in the future in the way of new uh, residents or new businesses or industry or whatever it may happen to be. And those three things are, first of all, what's known as the adjudication of the groundwater basin or the aquifer beneath us. There is a a sizable supply of water, but um, what has been going on for a number of years is that we're pumping out of that supply far more water than is naturally going back into that, that aquifer, that supply. And um, that's not something that is good for the community. It's not something that is allowed if it is... Uh, decided to be pursued through legal action is not allowed by the state. So at present and ongoing for gosh over 10 years now has been a process of conducting court hearings to decide how much, first of all, water can be pumped without overdrafting from that aquifer. And then the second part is allocating that to the various pumpers according to their rights under the law. And um, that's a, a very challenging, it sounds simple enough on the surface, but as you might well imagine, there are many, many different opinions about it. And uh, it, it, each case is separate and distinct and different, and so they have to be settled through the court system that way. There have been court hearings ongoing for a long time now, as I mentioned. I think the next one is scheduled for the 6th of October, if my date 
uh, my memory serves me correctly on that. So the adjudication of the groundwater basin is the first issue. And the second issue is the supplies of water that come through the state aqueduct, uh, a facility that the Antelope Valley East Kern Water Agency is a, uh, a contract or two, and through that contract have entitlements to a certain amount of water that would be imported from Northern California to Southern California and points in between. Um, what has happened is, uh, through the years, uh, initially it was thought that there was a very large amount of water that would be allocable to those participating contracting agencies such as AVEC. And uh, AVEC, for example, was expected to receive or entitled to receive about 141,000 acre feet of water. I'm not going to try to tell you how much that is. It's just a lot of water. Uh, and if we had that much water coming in, we would be in much better shape than we presently are. The reality is that over the last probably 10 to 15 years, the annual average available is probably closer now to about 60, if I remember correctly, 66,000 acre feet of water. So you can see it's significantly different from the 141,000 maximum entitlement. Worse yet, there have been recent judicial decisions in Northern California by a uh, superior court judge that have determined that the fish have been damaged because too much water is being pumped out of the Bay Delta area into that aqueduct system. So there was a court order that determined beginning the 1st of January 2008, I believe was the date, and extending for some time into the calendar year, that pumping would be restricted to 35% of allocations. So now suddenly we're down into this 40,000 or so acre feet a year range that AVEC can bring in. And then um, the next part of the equation is the actual amount of water that's available. We have been in a drought as, as a Vice Mayor Smith pointed out, and as decre decreed by the governor uh, earlier in June. That has reached such proportions that the Department of Water Resources is now projecting that the allocation of state water project to its state water contractors will drop from 35% to 10%. So now we're talking about AVEC receiving in calendar year 2009 only about 14,000 acre feet of water. 14,000 acre feet of water is the amount that will be available for all of AVEX customers. So everyone, there are some areas in, in Ventura County, and it extends throughout the Antelope Valley, well into Kern County, and uh, all the way to the San Bernardino Line. So they provide water to Edwards Air Force Base, to Boron, to uh, Rosamond, to Mojave, to you name it, in the Antelope Valley. If they're taking public water supply, they're probably getting it from AVEX. So reducing to 14,000 acre feet is severe. The third thing, of course, that has happened is the, has been not only a bad thing, but it's been a very good thing for the community. And it's what's led to the growing prosperity of the community. And that is the growth through development, either of residential properties or commercial industrial properties. And certainly that is an uh, objective of the community, and that is to continue to be prosperous in our, um, in our future. In order to do that, though, water will not be necessary. This ordinance, without going into great detail about it, what is included in here, is a very first step. And it's recognized also as being in that, that stage as a first step, something that will be subject to changes in the future. For that matter, as any ordinances, as more information is gathered and deeper understanding of conditions and what should be done as opposed to what should not be done is, is understood by our council and our mayor, uh, additional proposals will be brought to you to amend this ordinance or others that are related to water supply and water demand. And through that process, better ensure not only the continued prosperity of our existing citizens and businesses, but also for our future citizens and businesses. So in a perhaps a little bit extended, but hopefully not too long, uh, that is in a nutshell, I think, the conditions that we presently are facing. Very severe cutbacks in the amount of water that we have that we can actually use from a year-to-year -year basis. Are there other questions or Request that I can perhaps address for you. 
I assume that what we're looking at is... I'm sorry, sir. I assume what we're looking at in the very near future is we're going to be restricted. Yes, sir. We are expecting that... Um, actually, there was a, a long report that was presented to the um, L.A. County Board of Supervisors by Waterworks Organization, um, a part of the county, that um, went before the Board of Supervisors on the 1st of July. And this was... In my opinion, an, uh, a, a, an optimistically rosy look at what's going on in that they said they do not expect there to be any impact upon water delivery services in 2008. And then they said, who knows what's going to happen in 2009. It all depends on how much water is available. Um, the reality is, is that we know that we are already overdrafting. We're drawing more water out of that aquifer, that, as I mentioned before, than we, we can. We know that we're getting considerably reduced supplies, and we've been using what supplies have been available primarily in the past. So what we should be doing is with that extra water that we may be able to generate now, we should be banking that. We should be making it available for us to use next year, or 10 years from now, or 100 years from now. And that is one of the many um, suggestions that are floating around throughout our region as a regional solution to our water supply. Let me point out for the council's benefit and also for the public who is here that on next Tuesday, the 15th of July, the council has asked for and we are arranging a special water workshop where only water issues will be on the agenda for discussion. That meeting starts, as I said, Tuesday the 15th at 5 p.m. and we'll meet in these chambers. So at that time, we will be asking the council to participate through discussion of various ideas on yet another ordinance. That ordinance would pertain to landscaping standards within the city of Lancaster. So it's, again, another step. We're just trying to do this thing methodically. We're trying to make sure that we get through as, as much information as we can out through as many different sources as are available to our, our public. Uh, what the, the nature of the problem is, what the nature of the solutions are. We know what the solutions are. It's just going to require a great deal of willpower to get to those solutions. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Any communication? No communications. And we have some speaker cards. Two speakers. Two? Three. Three speakers. Mr. Barra, do you want to come first? Mayor, Council. Uh, first, I was very mad when I read that article in the newspaper. I kind of uh, thought we were going to, at the wrong way at looking at water. And uh, I, can't, I come to think about it, and then I started thinking, it, it's not about how we use our water, it's how much water we use. If you said to me, Joe, cut back the water, 10 percent. I'll cut back the water at 10 percent, but don't tell me how to use it. The other 90 percent, I can do anything I want with it. If you tell me 20 percent, I'll cut it back 20 percent, but don't tell me how to use the other 80 percent. So no matter what I do with it. But the idea is if we start chasing people down for petty stuff, we're wasting time, energy, money, court costs. Why don't you just go and check our water bills? The water bill tells you how much you use one month to the next month. If I, if I don't use my 10% or 20% less than I should be, warn me. Warn me again and then find me. But don't tell me how to use the water that I've got to use. It's like the city. I can't tell you how to use your water, but if I tell you to cut back 20%, you could cut back 20%. So we're wasting money and time going after petty stuff. Let's go at the heart of the stuff. Let's stop using water. And like I said uh, to the people of Lancaster, it's not how we use our water, it's how much water we use. Stop using water. Period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Mr. Weisenberger? Good evening, City Council Mayor. Uh, I'll make this quick. I've got some comments here. Uh, I totally believe in the wastewater ordinance. 
Uh, I'm not against it. I believe it has more tweaks that need to happen to it, and some of the tweaks you did tonight did a lot to helping this ordinance out. And so part of me is saying, please table it until you get the rest of the tweaks, and the other one say it's an ongoing document, and maybe it could be approved and go on from there. But uh, I'm going to make my comments and kind of questions and not expecting a reply. Um, reading the document, how did you determine a supply shortage? What is the process for going through a supply shortage? Are your purveyors going to say it? Is the governor going to say it? Is the county going to say it? What is your process for going through enacting a shortage? And so to me, you did the first step that really helped it. To me, the simple solution is is to do away with Section 848.040, which talks about applying when there's a shortage and move all that stuff into being wastewater. Why, why do you need to sit there and say, this is wasting water when we have a shortage, and it's not wasting water when we don't have a shortage? So why don't you make it just one? Uh, because the other one I'd love to see the council do, because you haven't thought about this, make a declaration, the drought is over, you can now waste water. Because <laughs> how are you going to determine when it's over, and then you're going to tell everybody, okay, now it's okay to waste water. So to me, moving all that up and just saying this is a water-wasting ordinance, whether there's a shortage or not, and, and do away with that section. That section, to me, should go to the water purveyors and saying this is what we're going to do to actually do conservation, and this is going to be wasting up beyond that point. And let your purveyors, because, uh, again, a question I have is, if LA County Water Works comes out and says you can only water on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's in conflict with your ordinance, who prevails? Is it the city ordinance or is it the purveyor's ordinance? Uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of confused between a little bit of the legalities between those. So I think you, you kind of do with that and leave that second section. You just move it up, and it's all part of, of water wasting. My second problem that I had, and again, I'm not an attorney, but uh, in that bottom section, D says allowing water or, app or the result of point of use to pond deeper than one quarter of an inch in any paved or unpaved surfaces, you've just described a swimming pool, a spa. You could even be... Pull, go as far as an evaporated cooler or dog water dishes. Uh, all those things would be ponding a more than a quarter inch in a non-use situation. So, you know, I, I, I have a concern with that one. Uh, I also have a concern that, and I know you took the whole general out, which was great, you uh, um, lawns and swimming pools use exactly the same amount of water. And if you really want to put something in about about swimming pools, it should be uh, pool covers are required in non-use situations. It's good safety practice, and it's a great water conservation because the evaporation of the pool is the same as the transpiration of your lawn. And so that's one on there. The other one, I don't run out of time here quick. Um, the uh, Can I go a little bit longer? Here? So what else were you going to say? I get to ask you a question. Okay. Well, <laughs> I got a couple of other real quick ones. Yes, go. Um, do 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 pools out. Uh, I think, and I know it's a city... A county ordinance, but beyond going on landscaping, I think you should require restaurants to have signs saying they will not serve water unless requested. Uh, most uh, hotels are already doing this, but signs up saying we're not going to wash towels or sheets unless requested. Those are all water saving and could easily fit into this instead of just hitting that. The big concern is there's no waiver or variances in here. You're on one hand telling people they need to have their front yard landscapes improved, especially after they buy a house or sell a house. If you're putting a sod lawn in, you can't water just at night and have your sod lawn survive. I'm not an advocate of just lawns, but you're not going to get a new landscape to survive by this ordinance. You're probably not even going to get Jed Hawk Stadium to survive by this ordinance because they normally need afternoon syringes. If you had a golf course in New York City, you wouldn't get a golf green to survive with allowing no afternoon water or anything like that. We call it syringe. It actually saves water than it does use water. And so I think there needs to be a conclusion in there for some sort of process to get a waiver or variance in order to do a new landscape. Or, uh, you know, I don't even sure Mike's back there, but whether you can even water the park between that time period because of the number of valves and stations that you have, whether you are even going to have the ability to do that. So that's kind of my uh, my quick ones. Questions if but again, I'm in favor. I'm not against this. I'm, I'm so so this. how do we how do we get the bulk of the watering to occur in the evening when well, it doesn't evaporate as quickly? One one their time and I didn't want to get into that. Their time, I think you took that from LA County Waterworks from their letter which comes from Alhambra. If we're really talking about saving water our issue is wind, not heat. 
And at 6 o'clock, you know, it says you can start at 6 o'clock at night. From 6 o'clock, what's our heat and what's our wind in the Antelope Valley? We should probably be going to somewhere closer to 11 or midnight and going till noon the next morning because you're probably cooler at 11 than you are at 7 o'clock at night in the summertime. Mr. Bell, Mr. Bell, I'm going to let you come back up, but you cannot speak from the audience, okay? Thank you. So, I mean, I, I think there's some tweaking on times and, and concerns, and like we say, one of our biggest things we use, especially in the athletic fields, is syringe cycles. Because if you're dying, if you're dying of heat stroke out there, uh, and you say, well, you can't have any water till later, if we give you a syringe, a cooling, cool the grass down, then it can start taking water back out of the soil, where most people, their lawn's dead, they come back the next day and start watering the lower, even though the soil's wet. And I, and I realize the problem of syringe cycles in ordinances, because how do you decide one minute at 1 o'clock in the afternoon? Uh, that it's a really tough one. But my variance isn't on the syringe cycle. My variance is on what do you do about Jet Hawk Stadium that needs that because of the grass and the game going later that night. What do you do about if you had a golf course? What do you do about some of those things? What do you do about well, a new we, landscape? We turn it on when the out-of-town players in the field, don't uh, okay. <laughs> As long as they're at night, though. Yeah. But to me, I, I think one of the biggest things is I would move all that up into the top, get away from having to even declare a water shortage. It's a water waste whenever it's a water waste. And I think that you need to put in a variance clause. It's something I can come in as a landscape contractor and say, I just put a new lawn in. I, I need a variance so they can water that lawn for the first month at 10, 2, and 4 to keep that sod alive and then be able to go to the regular schedule. So are you going to apply for the Architecture and Design Planning Commission? Uh, I don't know if that's a conflict with, because I don't want to get rent, conflict with my AVEC position or not. I'm not sure. It wouldn't be. Attorney. It wouldn't be. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. What, what, that's a very good possibility, yes. We would, like, we would invite you to do and it. And I have been, and I'm not trying to ball myself up, I have been working with Robert Neal and Randy okay. on issues and the landscape ordinance, too. So, I mean, it's not like we're out there left field. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Paul? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, thank you. Um, I really like this. I, I think this is the hope we need, uh, community involvement. This is great, and uh, I really like this um, urgency ordinance. Uh, it's urgent. Our problem is urgent. A lot of us have been talking about it, and this is the time to face it. Uh, I came here tonight to provide a little comic relief on this issue. Um, on the way over, I was at the substation before I turned uh, to come here, and the thing blew up, and it was a loud explosion, very loud, and I, I just thought this must be a small fraction of what our troops go through when IED goes off. And uh, I was reading in a magazine at a doctor's office yesterday about a um, large portion of our troops are on antidepressants, so uh, God help us there. I hope we get through that. But the water thing is is urgent, and uh, I, I just was reading through the um, staff report, and I noticed on the second incident, and I know this is a work in progress, it says that they uh, have to go undergo a water use audit provided by the water utility. Do we know how long that would take, or uh, how long with more people involved in that it would back up? And, and, you know, it seems like one of these functions that's out of our control could take forever to get to the next step. Uh, that was just one thought I had. But this was the, the part of the comic relief. I don't know, know how many of you remember uh, Noah's visit, but I was thinking at the Jet Hawks game, uh, they have Kaboom goes around, and there'd be nothing better if someone was overwatering their lawn to have Noah show up at their door and ask them to be a nice neighbor. We could have a city mascot and a, a volunteer to help you out. Thank you very much. I like that. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Vallow, did you want to come back up? Well, it's somebody else before him, but I, I just wanted to say a, a, a minute or two thing about the problem that he said. He, he brought up a lot of problems. And I'm from no, the no, you got to get to the mic first. Okay, right. Sorry. Well, I'm from New Jersey, and we've gone through this problem many, many, many times in New Jersey where we've had water shortages where you couldn't water your lawn, you couldn't fill your swimming pool, you couldn't scratch your butt. I mean, it gets so hot in New Jersey and the temperatures rise and the humidity is screaming at you. I would suggest if, he, if he's got questions like that, maybe call up the New Jersey uh, uh, Agricultural Association and maybe talk to them about what they would do about uh, golf courses, 
stadiums because they've been dealing with it a lot longer than we have as far as water shortages and, and problems. I've been there, I've done that, and uh, that's without having people coming around slapping your wrist either. They just would ask people to conserve and that's it. The people would do it. So I would suggest that if you, if you really want to look at it, New Jersey has been dealing with it for probably 60 years that I've been alive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Let's see on the speaker's cards. Is there no more speaker's cards? No more speaker's cards? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any discussion? Yes. You know, um, this is what's important about uh, public hearing and getting public input. I really agree with that. You know, looking through Section A through D of, uh, of uh, subsection of 8.4, 8.040, uh, these are these are not things that are drastic that you're doing only during a drought. These are things that other communities have in place all the time. So, I mean, unless the city attorney thinks of a reason why not, why don't we just scratch uh, section 8.4840 and start with subsection A, making it E through H, and that it is just considered water waste all the time. I mean, I don't see anything in there that, you know, like he said, once the drought's over, does that mean you can start doing it other times. We live in a desert. We're always going to have to conserve. We're looking at the future where we might have to, you know, the water companies might even ration us. We, we better start being water wise and prepared now. I know Victorville has this kind of stuff in place now. Colorado has this stuff in place now, all the time. Uh, do you see any reason on... I, I don't see any reason why we can't do that. Um, I do have some additional changes that I was jotting down as, as the discussion was going on. Um, in addition to the ones that uh, the changes that you suggested of taking out the certain languages in the um, in what was 040A um, the uh, limitation on the time of watering um, I would insert one of the one of the things that came up in a discussion we had this afternoon is that during winter months if you tried to water it other than these times you may very well be watering at a time when the water will freeze or will right. turn to frost and so I I just jotted down something and I mean it's open for discussion um, I would add after 6 p.m. the language except when the overnight temperature is forecast to fall below 45 degrees Fahrenheit could, could we do something if it's okay mr. mayor I know uh, the gentleman that spoke back there uh, he's uh He's one of the Valley's experts on water, and he was saying about what times of day can we ask him what is a, is a good idea for that, not only the times during the summer, but also for the winter and the temperature. Would that be? Maybe now? Yeah. Okay, so we can uh, actually find a, a good time and temperature. Is that something we can do from the, the, the lectern, or? I can do it if you want to. Okay. I'd be curious to ask him what would, you had suggested before, uh, instead of uh, during the summer months of the, the 9 to 6 p.m., you said it would be better maybe from, you know, from 10, 10, 10, 10 o'clock. 12 to 12 or 12 to 11, something like that, because the wind is the issue, not, not necessarily the heat. Well, when it's 110, the heat sort of helps. Well, <laughs> again, the, point, the, evaporation, the right. evaporation from your sprinklers right. actually prevents water being taken out of your soil. That's why I call it the evapotranspiration rate. Right. So, so something like 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. is good? Uh, yeah, that would work. I mean, something like that. I think the 45 degrees is a great starting point, but, I mean, at some point or another, working under document, I think that's a great way to solve it tonight so you could pass it tonight. But I think somewhere along the line, you may want to set October 1st, is this watering period January 1st? Is this watering period so that everybody's not on their own of saying, Ooh, it's, is it going to be 45 degrees tonight or not? Can I water during the day? Uh, but actually have some dates. And I think the 45 is a great one to start with, and we can come up with dates later. I, maybe we ought to. I, I agree with his comment about That's a good tweak for later on. Yeah, that, line. Well, no, I'm, I'm suggesting maybe we ought to, instead of uh, using temperature as the trigger mechanism, um, use months. Between I don't know between March one and and October thirty first or October first, um, it's only between ten and ten. Uh, other than that, it's you know pretty much when you want to water after freezing. You know ten o'clock in the morning till well, whatever, it's, you know whatever, whatever it is. You're using a lot of 
capacity. So do you, th do you think if we set the dates of uh, March thir 1st through October 31st? I, I think that is cleaner for 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. I agree. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that would work. I, I, if council is okay with that, then... Do we need a, a motion to amend? No, or? no we're just a, no, no. We're going to yeah. make a motion at the end of the whole okay. ordinance once it's all in. I'll, I'll add those dates in here. The, the, other, the other concept related to that was what uh, I think the same gentleman raised, the idea exemption. of new landscaping, right. an exemption for um, new landscaping. And it would basically say new landscaping shall be exempt until it is established um, to the satisfaction of the Director of Public Works. Or we can make it Director of Parks and Recs. I don't, I don't care which what, foreseeably, what if there's something that should be exempted that we're not thinking of right now? Can we make a, make a clause in there that would be point zero six zero that you can apply to the Director of Public Works for an exemption? And yes, yeah, and that would take care of that situation. That would take care of all situations that, uh, that were brought up. So that would, except for the new landscaping, we, we would want that within the ordinance itself so we don't have a thousand people. Right. No, that's a good idea. Or no, yeah. So you could put new landscaping in there, but say you can also apply for an exemption for uh, to the public works. Um, I'm thinking it's more of a um, provision for a blanket exemption uh, upon application, and what the mayor that would cover any that. any foreseeable uh, exceptional circumstance. Obviously, right. landscaping is one of them. But personally, I, I like the idea of a blanket one. Because again, you're you're easier to enforce it if they have to come. I mean, it's a pain as a contractor to come in to do it, but it it gives you a start date and a stop date, not right. just I have a new landscaping and I have 30 days. But when does when does the code enforcement officer know when 30 right. days are? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, so when is it mature enough to survive so on its own? A lot of places doing this do their variance by coming and getting an application. So if we as I'm looking at it, as we scratch point zero four zero and then uh, we move up the other two sections, yeah. that would be point zero six zero then for the exemption clause. Um, moved all the other numbers up. I was going to stick it in as Mr. Mayor or zero, or whatever you like. the other one. You're the attorney, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry for interrupting, and I know that my uh, opportunity to address the council had expired already. But if I could <laughs> be indulged for a moment or two, I would like to explain the reason why we have section zero three zero and section zero four zero. Um, and why we have the term uh, periods of water shortage. It's not just during periods of drought that we have periods of water, water shortage, but there are other occasions when for purposes of repair to systems, for example, we have to go to our citizens and have them, as Mr. I think it was Mr. Varro um, suggested, that we cut back by 15% or 20% or whatever. So what we were trying to do is we were trying to identify in the first section, 030, those things that were, in our minds at least, clearly identifiable as wasting of water at any time, and then prohibiting them at any time by virtue of this ordinance. But then the distinction of during periods of water shortage and that would apply to 040 would provide some additional measures that perhaps normally are not considered water, in fact, they would not be considered water wasting, they would just be, during these periods of water shortage, considered to be excessive or unauthorized. And what we were trying to do was to cover both of these options or opportunities in this ordinance. I think, you know, as, as I said in my earlier remarks, there certainly is lots of room for improvement of this. And not to sound like I'm trying to make a fun, but I would, a pun, I, I would really ask, though, that we not water this down too much. Because that was good. what we need to do, <laughs> I, I just couldn't contain myself, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can tell. What we really need to do is, is, is we need to start the process and we need to make sensible exceptions to what may appear on some occasions to be general rules that are in this this particular ordinance, and I think that our code enforcement staff does that already in its application of the municipal code across the board. You know, they, they warn people, they advise people, they educate people, they say, you know, really if you do it a different way, you know, it could be done better. Okay. And ordinances, as our council well knows, are written not for you know, to, well, they, they are written to regulate everyone's lives, but the people who need to be regulated are not, you know, the 90-plus percent of the population because they're going to do what's right. 
The problem is, is that we need something that has enough, enough teeth, enough definition, so that we can also take care of that neighbor in that 10% category who won't do it unless he has, um, it's, it's brought to his attention through some series of, uh, of enforcement actions. The difficulty that we invariably run against is the neighbor who says, well, look at that guy next door, or look at the guy across the street. He's got water running down the sidewalk all the time. So why should I be doing voluntarily then what I know in my heart is right? And if we have, again, watered this down so much that we can't do anything with that 10%, then we've lost an opportunity. Now, I've expressed my opinion. I should have probably done that earlier. I apologize for interrupting. But I felt that it needed to be said. Mr. Williams, I don't, I don't, I agree with you that it shouldn't be watered down, but I actually believe, and the city's attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, we're actually strengthening it. Because there you, the city council or whatever doesn't have to declare a water shortage. We're saying you got to do it all the time. And, uh, I mean, except for the exempt, exempt, exemptions, which I think there should be some flexibility in the law because there's always something. Where does it water it down if you say, you know what? Because I'm reading through this. This is stuff that should be done all the time. We live in the desert. And, and by making it a water waste, am I correct on that, Mr. McEwen? Would you, that, would that, would be be my, that would be my interpretation of this change. You know, other than the things that were, we're tweaking and maybe taking out, which, you know, maybe that's watering some of the provisions down, but I don't think so. But by including the stuff that would only be applicable during a period of water shortage into the at any time section, I right. think you've strengthened it. Strengthened um, it. And made it, made it harder. Correct. To and Mr. Williams, the things that, that I requested to come out, which, which are, are great. Uh, as instruction, everything you know, I think they should be moved to where because they're not regulatory. I don't think any court in the world would look at any of those and be able to to decipher that that's actually a regulatory action of the statute. But it's actually to help the people understand a better way of doing it. I mean, like you know, the idea of well, it's better to water your lawn at this time and this amount. So we're not telling you the people they have to do it that way. We're saying this is the best way to do it. So that's why I know I, I talked to Mr. McEwen and also the other attorney, that that needs to be moved to something that's a non-regulatory part of the, uh, the statute or the ordinance. Yeah, I think those things that we took out that were non-regulatory, I think those are best in, incorporated into educational materials and uh, probably put on the website uh, for the city. Um, I, I don't want to dictate how this gets out to the citizens, but right. and that would be an obvious place to put it, and, no, and there may be a substantially a, a number of others that could be could be used to get that information out. Um, the other changes that um, that I picked up as we went through this is that under what was 040C and would now be 030G, um, that section I've added but shall not prohibit the washing of windows. Right, correct. And then in the, uh, the next section, uh, the former section D, uh, just my question, do you want to include in there a sentence that says this section shall not apply to swimming pools? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That, that's clarification. Because I understand, I talked to Mr. Williams about what this was for, and, um, and basically that section just... Not to put words in, in Mr. Williams' mouth, but he explained it to me. Is is you know you have somebody that has a lawn, and somebody who's overwatering. You can see the water rushing off on the sidewalk. But somebody who's overwatering that's not graded properly, you could end up with a little pool. And so that's what that or that is. Am I correct? That's what yeah, that, I think that's that's primarily that's that's the issue. But right. if water is being allowed to pool and it's there for any length of time, then it means it's not getting into it's the It's not being used properly. And it's right. not providing any beneficial use. Except when you have a big hole filled with plaster and some tile and a driving board. Oh. So I think, yeah. Exactly. Well, in, 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 pool. in addition to swimming pools, it would seem to me it, it would apply to fountains and other decorative water features. Yeah. Whatever, whatever wording that okay, you think we'll is add, appropriate, we'll that's okay. No, I think that's good. Any other changes, Mr. McEwen, on that? Um, the only other change consistent with the variance uh, provision, uh, I did make that section 060. I changed 050 to 040, et cetera. I changed those and put it in because I think that really put does the fit there better. Stuff in there. Um, and that section would be very simple. It would state, upon application of a property owner or occupant, the city manager may grant a variance to the provisions of this chapter. Okay. I think that's good. 
Do you have a swimming pool, Mr. City Manager? <laughs> well, no, I do not, sir. Okay. You know, I, I, would, I would like, if I may, to point out, as Mr. Williams pointed out, this is an urgency ordinance, and it's intended to deal with an emergency situation. I would like to point out that a lot of these ideas uh, can be expressed as well in the water workshop next Tuesday and incorporated uh, as we refine this ordinance into another ordinance as well, too. I'm assuming we're going to, to redo this ordinance after the workshop, right? Either redo or replace, yes. Okay, good. Yes. Thank and you. I would invite Mr. Weisenberger, who I think had some good ideas, to attend the workshop as well. Yes. Uh, Mr. McEwen, I have one more question. Mr. McEwen, should there be a severability clause in there? What? A, a, sever, a severability clause. I mean, that severs any, I mean, if something's found wrong by a court on part of it, I mean, like we do now, it doesn't need anything like that. Ah, I, just, I just wondered. Uh, it's, it's, this is not a bad idea. We can, we'll add a severability clause. Yeah. <laughs> just in case. You never know. Anyone else? Mr. Smith, it, it, it is very difficult for elected officials to tell people what they cannot do. And, you know, I agree with Mr. Vara that I don't like anybody telling me what to do with what I own. Uh, I mean, I thought you made a good point. The, the other side of that, however, is re remember when, when the biblical... Uh, and where they had the okay, but when they had the dream about the the seven years of famine. All right, all right, Mr. Barra, I, I shouldn't have addressed you because you're really not allowed to talk from the audience. In any event, we've we've been warned. We've got seven years of famine, and if we allow if we allow people to waste what what's there. When the famine hits, we all suffer. And I think that's why it, it's appropriate for government to, to come in and say, no, you don't get to waste this even if it is yours. Uh, but back to you, Mr. Smith. It took incredible courage for you in particular to, to be in the vanguard of this because it's going to be unpopular. And you've had your share of unpopular feelings. Yeah. Uh, well, I... <laughs> Some people think so. But the point is, is, is I, I appreciate it. it. It took enormous courage. It's going to take enormous courage. You're going to take incredible abuse from people who you're going to be restricting. But I, but I think that that is one of the, uh, the obligations of leadership. And you stepped up and took it, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like your, uh, Mr. Mayor, your example. And I think, I think all of us up here as elected officials, we see the... Um, what Mr. Williams has said, the doomsday um, numbers that could happen depending on what the state water project gives us and uh, depending on what the snowpack is in 2009, uh, we don't know. But if we don't prepare for it, we could be in trouble. And then everybody's going to come to us and say, you knew about it and you didn't do anything. Uh, I know I was, uh, we were talking about the numbers and we can talk in thousands of acre feet and how much ABAC gets and how much the water district comes and everything. And I was telling this to my wife the other day. She goes, look, put it in terms I understand. I said, well, the amount of water that we use now in 30 days, we run out of water in 15. That means you can't flush your toilet on the 16th day. And that's what we have to really look at. Water is not a, it's not a commodity. It's a resource. And in our case, it might become a smaller resource, so we have to be prepared. It might not, but we do live in the desert, and it is getting worse. And, and yes, we do. We would be remiss if we didn't do something. Thank you. You know, there's gotten a few letters and emails over the last few days on this subject, and, and I think Council Member Smith would agree that occasionally he and I are on opposite sides of the street on a given on some issues. No. In this case, we're not. This is. Uh, uh, this is a good ordinance. This ordinance isn't the end of this issue. All this ordinance does is regulate wasteful water practices. It does not limit beneficial uses of water. We haven't even begun to go down that road yet because we don't know how far down that road we have to go because we don't know exactly how much water we're going to get or not get. Rest assured, if we don't start doing things like this ordinance proposes, we will be going down that road. 
I think we will be going down that road anyway. It's just a question of how far. Because the state's not giving us much more water in the foreseeable, foreseeable future. We're overdrafting our water. We've got 27,000 approved housing units out there that are going to need water. Uh, that's something we're going to have to deal with down the road. That's something our general plan is going to have to take into account. But this is a good first step. But I do want to emphasize this is just dealing with wasteful practices. And we need to make this strong. We need to pass this. If I, if I may, there's a couple more things that I wanted to add that we talked about the other day. Is uh, I know the headline in the newspaper says wastewater and you're going to get hit with a thousand dollar fine. And I, I think we staff in the city we wanted to clarify that there has to be some kind of tooth to an ordinance. The main emphasis, and I've been saying this a lot, the main emphasis of this ordinance and what our code enforcement is going to be doing is education and voluntary compliance. The tooth to the law there is for the person that refuses to stop his wasteful water use and that we have to go back again and again and finally say, okay, look, you, know, you can't just run your hose in the driveway in the gutter for a couple hours. You, you know, this is water that is for our grandkids someday. This is water that we need. Um, and that's what the tooth is for. And, and I want to tell the public, too, and we're going to put a, a phone number on our website. We're not perfect. The city's not perfect. The county's not perfect. You know, no agency out here is perfect. So if you see us wasting water, give us a call and tell us. I mean, if you see a sprinkler broken, if you think we're watering too much, if you see a leaky faucet someplace, if you think we're wasting water, call us. Because our staff is going out there trying to fix all of these. It's hard for us to take care of it. You know, hard to see everything. We're a community. We're a family. We need to work on this together because this is very important. You know, what I see is I see Mr. Wilson doing a story about a year from now about the two neighbors. The one neighbor who listened to all of this, figured out a way to put the right sprinkler system in, the right timer on, the right drip system, and then the neighbor who just ignored all this. And you're going to see neighbor after neighbor where this occurs. One person's going to have a dead yard, and he's going to be very upset. And the one who's listening to us now is going to have landscape that's thriving. I think the landscaping in our homes is important. It's important to me. I, I, I put, you know, hundreds of hours in, into it. Uh, and I also see how difficult it is to, to change how I do it because, you know, I go out and get estimates and they come back $80,000 for fake grass. You know, well, we can't do that. <laughs> and it, it, it's a process, but it's a process we've got about three months to three, three months, maybe four months to work on. Or five or six months from now, we get to watch everything die. And then, you know, it doesn't matter who you're mad at. You come home to a dead yard. So let's see what we can do. Well, Mr. Mayor, if I could say... Yes, sir. Yeah, they just came in. But. You know, one of the things I want to acknowledge um, before we either take action or if we've got another speaker cards is that <clears throat> I really think that we want to make a point that everybody needs to understand. I really think we're at our turning point. Um, I, I think that for the people that have lived here many years, I hope that tonight I just saw a collaboration go back and forth four or five different ways, whether it was somebody that was here tonight to speak on behalf of water, or it was Mr. Williams, or it was Mr. Bozigian, or Mr. McEwen, or the mayor, or the vice mayor. You know, what we saw was an exchange, and, and I, you know, again, to, to reiterate what was already said, you know, when you read, read those headlines, I know that there may have been some knee-jerk reaction with some of the people that live here in the city of Lancaster. And I think that they need to realize we're at that turning point, and then I would hope that everybody would keep their mind open because to Council Member Ed Cilio's comment, I think we've just begun here. I think at some point in time we may have to cross those roads, and God forbid that we run into that this next year where we find out that we're on rationing. And... Uh, so I just think that everybody needs to keep an open mind and be prepared, and, and I appreciate everybody's openness this evening. Thank you. Um, 
I have two speaker cards. The, the public hearing's been closed. If I open the public hearing, then my council members get mad at me and tell me that I shouldn't do that, that eventually it's going to be mayhem. But this one more time will open the public hearing, and if uh, I, I, I can't read your last name. Okay, would you like to uh, start? Yes. I would actually make, I will make this very, very quick, but what I'd like to know is um, what is Lancaster City itself doing to evade um, the extensive uses of usage of water? Now, we've all seen a lot of buildings going up, and we also have the Planning Commission, and within those, we see a lot of really nice shrubbery and really nice trees that are basically high maintenance. Um, another thing was... Um, I, unfortunately, because of the change of time, I was late. Uh, people with pools. Um, there's certain situations that happen. Are they going to be required to get permits in order to drain their pool? Um, are they going to have long-standing water? We actually spoke to about five different landscapers today, and they we were told that the best times to actually water your grass, to use the least minimal amount of water, is anywhere from five to seven minutes, early in the morning, late afternoon, and early evening. And that goes in direct um, uh, conflict with this ordinance. The other thing is if, we're, if we have ordinances that require us to maintain our yards to look a certain way, how is that going to affect it? If we're, if, you know, you're, you're, this ordinance seems to be conflicting with other, other ordinances that the homeowners out here have to comply with. Um, the leaky uh, things inside of the house, um, how will those be addressed? Will that give the, the city right to come into anybody's house? Not on my watch. <laughs> but there are concerns out there because a lot of those aren't specified. There's a lot of technicalities that aren't specified, and those are a lot of the concerns because it, it opens the doors for a lot of possibilities, and that's what I think that the public is really concerned about. You know, there's, there's a lot of little things um if you if you water your grass seven minutes it starts to run off well how many people know that do you understand what i mean so i think the education is really really good but also you know what what within the lancaster city are you guys going to do yourselves to um negate this this use it's the same thing with the electricity you know, if we give pe uh, certain commercial people the power to utilize as much as they can, the homeowners and the people and the, uh, the citizens of Lancaster are the ones who are paying the price because we have to go without so that they can have. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you. I just got to note that this is not a public hearing. What does that mean? It's not a noticed public hearing, so it's not one that you open and close. It's just a new business item to be discussed. So they get to talk? Well, at your discretion. Okay. <laughs> when, when the mayor used the term public hearing, he was really talking about public comment portion of this item. And the record should reflect that. You guys got a code going, you know that? <laughs> we do. We're just trying to keep you straight. Uh, Kathleen Morgan? I just have a couple questions. Um, I was wondering, I don't know if you if you addressed this before, but I um, wonder if you could clarify the leak into the ground or into any sink, bowl, toilet, or tub connected with the sewer or cesspool. I don't know what that means. This was in the AV Press. I just read that. And the other one is um, something about a, a week for an unreasonable length of time. I mean, how are they going to monitor all this? You know, the, the answer to this is most of it we don't know. You know, we're, we're in new ground here. It's new territory for us. And that's why we're putting on the public workshops and we're inviting people to come in and share their knowledge like you just saw with Mr. Weisenberger. There's a lot of people in this community that are going to be able to help us figure this out because this is a community problem. It's not a city problem. It's a community problem. And together, we'll be able to figure it out and fix it. If we don't do it together, then it's not going to work. And what's going to happen is, is any type of growth is going to stop. Our quality of life is going to diminish. It's not going to be the wonderful place to live. It can be. You know, 
but if we work together on it, I think we're going to be able to preserve the quality of life up here. And actually, there's a part of me thinking that this is something that might bring the community closer together than it's ever been because it is a community problem that the community has to solve. And I think uh, Vice Mayor Smith is putting us in the right direction and that it is open to the community, the workshop's open to the community, and we will figure it out together. Are we, are we, I don't mean to interrupt you, but are we looking okay. at other landscaping, like, yes. you know, yes. professionals, uh, it, and what other cities are doing that work and stuff uh, like that? Vice Mayor Smith is traveling around now looking at, at cities and the, and the way the developers are handling it, the way the, the homeowners are handling it, and he's coming back with a lot of ideas as to, to how to fix this. He's invested an enormous amount of time into leading this effort. Uh, and it's you know it's uncompensated time. It, it's, it's when I when I say how much I appreciate it, I just can't say enough. The the amount of effort he's putting into this. Uh, we're not going to pay Mr. Weisenberger over there either. Uh, the 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 point of it is is that if we look at this situation as something the city is going to solve for the, the the community, I can tell you right now we will fail. It has to be a community effort. And it has to be community-wide for it to be effective. I think it will be. Uh, and is the idea of anybody going into anybody's home to check their faucet? I don't think so. <laughs> that, that will never happen. All right? There, this is nothing to be afraid of. It is something that we should be looking forward to working together on. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Paris? Yes, sir. Might I add one thing to that? I think the speaker makes an important point that I'd like to talk about voluntary compliance. A lot of laws expect voluntary compliance, a seatbelt law, uh, a cell phone, etc. Ninety percent of the folks comply with it because it's the law and it's the right thing to do. And pointing that out, voluntary compliance will happen. Um, if everyone decided not to wear seatbelts, there's not enough enforcement in the world to get them to do that. So part of this is exactly what you said, the community realizing it's the right thing to do and doing it. Okay. Thank you. We're looking for a motion, Elmer. Um, Captain Anderson, would you come get this cell phone, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not driving. <laughs> okay. I move that we adopt the urgency ordinance number 905 as we've now gone through the iterations and currently written. Is there a second? I'll second that. Let's vote. Then it's passed unanimously. Oh, and now it's my turn. The appointment of the Architectural Design Planning Commissioners. Mr. Wilson's over there thinking, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it without the public notice? And no, I'm not, because I'm not ready to do it yet. But I am going to do this. Uh, I want to announce that uh, I'm going to take this item off the agenda, and but I do want everyone to know that Mr. Darren Parker is going to uh, assist me in getting the, the Architectural Planning Design and Planning Commissioner's names out there and so we can approve them next week. I'm also going to ask that he will be the, uh, and nobody has to vote on this so there's no need for notice, to be the, uh, the interim chair of that commission because I, w I do intend to appoint him. Uh, and so we can get this thing up and running and, and moving quickly after the next meeting. Um, I, I've been attending the Human Relations Task Force meetings, and I can't tell you how impressed I am with that. It, it's, uh, you have, you've accomplished something there, uh, bringing a lot of uh, people who might normally not get along together for, for a common goal, and I hope you're able to bring those talents to the Architectural and Design Planning Commission, assuming uh, my colleagues here vote you in. Okay. So that's the story on that. City Manager, do you have any announcements? Two quick announcements, sir. One, I'd like to thank all the staff that participated in helping put on the 4th of July um, celebration at the fairgrounds and our sponsors. It was a wonderful event, and we sometimes take for granted, but people give up their 4th of July to put that event on and work. Um, the second item uh, with the brownout that I think David Paul mentioned, the cable may not have worked tonight, so if folks want to look at it, uh, the, the uh, council meeting, they can go on the website. They were trying to get the cable up, but the brownout knocked it out at the beginning of the meeting.
I mean, I didn't need to wear a tie. I wasn't on television. Or no comment, <laughs> sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, what do we have left? We have seven speakers. <laughs> oh, City Clerk, do you have any announcements? We request that any person who would like to address the redevelopment agency and the council on non-agendized matters to complete a speaker card, and you will find the speaker cards at the back of the council chambers. Additionally, we respectfully request that you fill the cards out completely and print as clearly as possible so that if necessary, the council, the city manager, and staff will be able to contact you either by phone or mail. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. When you approach the podium, Please notice there are three lights. The green light will come on when you begin. The yellow light will come on when you have 30 seconds left. And the red light comes on when your time is up. We ask that you be considerate of the allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes as well. Following this procedure will allow for a smooth and timely process for the City Council and the agency, and we appreciate your cooperation. State law prohibits the City Council and the agency from taking actions on items that are not on the agenda, and your matter will be referred to the City Manager. Also, to help our meetings run smoothly, we respectfully request that when you are called to the podium to please leave all personal belongings at your seat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Mang. Good evening, Mayor Paris, and uh, I, I guess I should disclose, 20 years ago you babysitted the kids. <laughs> yes, I did. Over 20 years ago, I babysat your twins. <laughs> Good to see you've moved up in the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for letting me speak. Um, on May 6th, approximately 7.30 in the morning, I was traveling back from taking my son to school on Avenue M at approximately 45th Street West. Um, I came upon two rather large potholes and was able to avoid one of them and the front end of my car, which was just barely a year old, with brand new rims and tires on it, I fell into. I was able to avoid an oncoming collision with another car, however, I was not able to avoid hitting the second pothole. My vehicle, the one wheel, one rim, one strut, and the alignment was very extremely damaged and I went back and took a picture. Uh, I made a claim with the city on the 9th. The claim was denied, and I'm here to possibly ask the city and the council to relook at this. Um, the claim was for $700. I ended up having to pay um, almost $2,000, not the fault of anyone else other than the $700. Um, Sears was unable to replace the one tire and the one rim. They didn't carry it, so I w was forced to buy a whole new set of rims. I didn't place that claim. That has nothing to do with the city. Um, I just feel that this was not my fault. I've never done this before, never made a claim or anything. And I've never asked for anything, but I just really, really felt um, victimized, you know. And I went back and took the pictures approximately an hour and a half later, and the holes were filled. So the city did react upon, you know, me you know, falling in them and almost really having a serious accident. I appreciate that. However, I just don't feel that this was my fault, and I'm just asking the city to take another look at that. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> no? Okay. I, I have some questions of the city attorney. Uh, I get the sense that that's what, hap what happens with these folks is that they file a claim, and then as a matter of course it's denied whether it's a valid claim or, or not. And, and before, before you respond, I want, I want you to think about it and tell me just what exactly do we do. I don't know what the law is as regards to who's responsible for a pothole that causes damage to a car. If, if she had been hurt, something tells me I'd probably know real quick. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, there's a difference. There's a difference from people that have, you know, serious, serious claims that when the city denies them, then, then I think the courts are the appropriate place to deal with those. But what about the, the small claims, the $700 claim? Are they denied as a matter of course? Uh, no, sir. What do they do? The, when a claim comes in, um, it's reviewed by uh, staff. Um, to determine potential liability. Um, 
And when we look at, at these, I, I don't personally look at each one of them, but uh, staff reviews those. Um, there, there's obviously a question of liability um, in most cases. Some of them are pretty clear, and, and we negotiate settlements uh, very quickly uh, with those um, without denying the claim first. Uh, for those that it's not as clear, uh, then we deny the the claim based on, um, well, in order to uh, start the statute of limitations running. That doesn't mean that it necessarily is the end of the time period in which to negotiate a some settlement or an outcome um, in that case, but we do deny the claim so that the statute of limitations begins running. Um, on the bigger claims, they go to a company called Carl Warren. Um, uh, the devil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they they review the they they go into some detail in the review of the claims uh, for those, and they make a recommendation. Um, and in, in I would say most cases with the larger claims, it is to deny the claim initially, and then we'll we'll go from there and, and sort it out through the courts. In, uh, in this case, you know, perhaps because we have known her for twenty years, you know, she knew to call my wife, and my wife was beating me on the head over it. Uh, not literally. Uh, but we didn't know what to do. I, I mean, I'm the mayor. I didn't know how it works. What what she told me was, or what she told my wife, was that it, it was just denied and she had no recourse. And, and no, that's, so that's, that is not true. The denial letter itself specifies the course of action that can be taken. Which would be which, what? Which would be a small claims case. Um, or other litigation. If it's below the limit on small claims, it can certainly go to a small claims court. Um, well, couldn't we do better? And, and again, they can uh, communicate with staff and, and attempt to uh, convince them that, that, in fact, there is a pretty clear case, um, and, and we'll look at those. The, the one thing that, that we do experience um, a lot is the deep pocket syndrome. I mean, we are the deep pockets. And while some of these cases seem like they're fairly small, when you add all those small cases together, they add up to a very large sum. And so we, we take the, the questionable liability cases pretty seriously. You know, let, let's let a court determine it. Um, or get to the point where our insurance company will pay for it. Which is that's pretty high. Yeah, it's got to get big, right? If if they got a big claim, then somebody pays attention to them. Yes. But it's the it's the working folks that have a seven hundred dollar claim, and you know what are you going to do? You're going to spend five grand for a lawyer to tell you what, what how to get seven hundred? I mean, I, I just think there's something we should be looking at here, Mr. Bozigian, as to at least have somebody within the city. Be, be able to, to talk to the person involved and make a credibility decision. Because, because what I'm seeing in this case, you know, I mean, sure, she could be making it up. When she was 19, she might have done that, but she's not going to do it now. <laughs> the, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying? We, we don't have that process, and so as a result, we have a lot of mad citizens. I'd be furious if, if, if uh, that was the case. I mean... This, this case, I guess, got under my skin simply because it seems to me that it ought to be clear what the law is. Are we responsible for potholes? We're responsible for any public defect that we have notice of. And the question is, do we have notice or should we have had notice okay. of this? And I think in, in many respects, potholes, you know, if they've been there for a while and somebody's filed a complaint with the city that there's a pothole and we have notice if you know unless uh, beyond that they, they can appear very quickly for which we would not have notice so, so, so that's always a matter of, of proof and a matter of fact that has to be proved in, in this particular case did somebody make the inquiry to see if we have notice of it that would be part of the evaluation yes right. That'd be part of it. I think what I'd like to suggest is, is that we could give the council an ex explanation of our procedure but I would caution, because I have worked at an agency that was known as would settle, and it cost the agency a bloody fortune, to be quite frank. And um, I think our process does 
provide people with an outline. It provides people that they can talk to and they can question it and talk to them. But I'd like to provide the council first with what our process is and then go from there. I would like our reputation to be that we're the city that's fair. I mean, first of all, I don't think anybody that knows me thinks I settle anything easily. But I would like them to think that I was fair. And, and what I'm hearing is that in, in order to avoid uh, a reputation of settling cases, sometimes maybe we're not fair. And I think that, that our, our focus should be more on the fairness of it. And, and quite honestly, if, if we should be held accountable, we should be held accountable. I mean, what, what I don't, I just, I just don't like the idea of telling citizens to pound sand uh, because we can. And, and, I, I, and I, wanna, I want us to try to do better than what we've been doing in regards to that. Okay. I hear you. We will provide you with what the current process is and then go from there and we'll look for improvements as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wall. My name is John Wall. I live in Sherwood Mobile Home Park. Which, when did you want me to dress first? Uh, up to you. Cause I, okay, the lawn water, watering. Uh, something came to my attention this afternoon. Well, number one, I really enjoy what Mr. Smith is doing in regards to trying to conserve water. Well, I was coming back from Panorama City at 2.30 this afternoon. Went by the West Soccer Field on 30th Street East. All the sprinklers are going. I look down, it's 109 degrees. I don't think that falls in line with what Mr. Smith wants to do, or what I want to do, or any taxpayers. Got up to Cole Intermediate School, but six minutes later, all the sprinklers are going out there on their lawn. See how those school districts are. <laughs> Enough said about that one. Uh, I think somebody needs to look into it. We absolutely will. I, mean, I think that's the is, to this is will. what Mr. Smith wants is let's don't do it between 9 in the morning and 6 at night or reasonably close. Enough said about that one. <clears throat> the other item that I want to talk to was in regards to ordinance number 900. I greatly appreciate all the effort that all five of you have put into this ordinance. But I'll bring a couple questions. Section 1 where it says, define senior mobile home park is a mobile home park in which at least 80% of the spaces are occupied or intended for occupancy by at least one person who is 55 years of age or older, or in which 100% of the spaces are occupied or intended for occupancy by persons 62 years of age or older. The thrust of the ordinance was to prevent children from moving into the mobile home parks that were delineated in this ordinance. Okay, when you go to section 6, subparagraph B, it has some more verbiage that basically, in essence, at least one person has to be 55 years or older in each coach. So the question I have can children move into the park or not? That was the thrust of the ordinance. Uh, and to continue on this, I have placed three calls to the city attorney in Newport Beach in the last two weeks. No call back. I know the Mobile Home Park Association president and at least one or maybe two other representatives met with the city attorney and no decision was made whatsoever. Excuse me, he, he actually addressed two items. Okay. So basically my question is, can we get a reading? What is the legality of the ordinance? If it does prevent children from coming in the park, great. If it doesn't, I think we need some rewriting. That that's 
seems to make sense to me, and we should look into that. However, I, I want to be clear in regards with the city attorney. We would not want him returning citizens' calls. And, and the reason for that is is he costs a lot of money. You know? I mean, uh, that is something that staff should be talking to you about, and if staff needs a legal decision, they would go to him to do it. But the city attorney could have at least said, I can't give you a reading, but I'm going to turn it over to Mr. So-and-so. That certainly your, your messages should have been returned by somebody from the city, yeah. and, and let's see if we can figure out a way to do that. But but we would absolutely not want the city attorney okay, I understand to, that. to do that. Um, and I think, one, if, it, if, it, if the legalese of the ordinance does prohibit children from moving in, fine, maybe we ought to clarify it a little bit more so yeah, I think person, it's a legit, legitimate question. person would understand it. <clears throat> Mr. Bazilian, could you uh, have staff look at that and figure out what the answer is, and then if we need to amend, we should amend. Yes, um, yes we will, and I would just echo what you said. If someone calls City Hall, we would refer to the appropriate person, whether it be the city attorney, a department head, etc. So in the future, if you have issues, if you call City Hall, we will address it. That'd be fine. And, and Mr. Mayor, it's not my practice to avoid calls. I actually thought Mr. Wall was going to be at the meeting last Tuesday that we had in the afternoon, and I was then after that point in time uh, did not have an opportunity to call him back to find out what his question was but I thought it was consumed by was the topic and apparently it was consumed by the topic of that meeting I know how you attorneys are <laughs> I, I'm serious I don't think that is the, the role of the city attorney I, well, I, I generally agree but I, I, I also don't try to avoid calls sure. uh, if sure. you know I pick up my phone a lot myself I don't let my secretary answer it and I will take and call and talk to anybody that wants to call me, uh, or I'll tell them I I don't have the answer and I'll have to get back to them, or someone will get back to them. Um, so I, I don't mind doing that. It takes a couple minutes mostly. Okay. But um, and I I would have called him back, but I assumed that he was getting the report from uh, Ray Chavira and others that were at the meeting. And the other thing too is if you want to send me an email. All the emails that I get are eventually responded to. If it requires a long response, then sometimes it takes longer. If it's short, I get them out in the morning. Well, I appreciate uh, what the attorney is saying. But at least call back and say, I can't give you a reading because of, or have the secretary call and say, whatever. You know, our city attorney takes a lot of heat. I know attorneys. I know good ones. I know bad ones. I mean, that is the one thing you could absolutely rest assured of. I know how to evaluate attorneys, mm -hmm. and we've got a great one. And uh, you know, it's that's not a complaint. It's just a, a comment. Uh, I think the bottom line is: well, number one, no, I didn't get my answer from Ray Chavera or the other people that that met with him. See how Ray is. <laughs> but uh, well, in fairness, to Mr. Chavira, he didn't get an answer from me that day either. Okay. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we need a reading. Yes. And well, I guess let's see if we can have something in two weeks. Can we do it? It's just a hash over. You know, if it if it does prevent children from moving in, great. That's really what the thrust of it was. True. If it doesn't, maybe we need to go back to the chalkboard and change a few words. Okay. Thank you. But as far as the watering. I think what Mr. Smith is doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pelka. Basically, I am responding to uh, an issue that happened last uh, council meeting when I was here and talked to you about the removal or possible removal of Mr. Smith uh, as uh, his position on the council because of his uh, admission to being uh, the designer of the hit mailers. Now, the conversation I had with you, Mr. Paris, after the meeting uh, kind of disturbed me a little bit, which is why I tend not to want to ever talk to you on a private basis because of the fact of... Uh, and don't talk to me. Well, I'm not going to from that. Who could that be? But, but basically, I think it's rather fair that I should uh, let Mr. Celia and Mr. Mann know what you said. Uh, they know what I said. I'll tell them. That if, if you guys, if meaning Mr. Mann and Mr. Cilio, disrupt this city with a recall against Mr. Smith for political reasons, they will not, he will not be the only one recalled. That's what I told you. 
Isn't that what I said? You did not say Mr. Mann and Ms. Cecilia was involved in the recall because they are not involved in the recall. I just told you what I told you. No, you did not tell me that. No, I'm not going to argue with you. You told me you had your three minutes. What you said to me, what you said to me was if you start a recall on Mr. Smith, I will personally start a recall on Mr. Mann and Mr. Cecilia. You misunderstood me. That's what you told me. You misunderstood me. No, I did not misunderstand you. I'll take a polygraph test any time you want to. I know exactly what you said. Thank you. Anything else? Um, let's see, I've got a minute and 55 seconds. I could come up with all kinds of stuff, but, well, basically, uh, that's kind of about what I wanted to say. You sure? Yeah, right now. Because you know. obviously you and I aren't going to be having any conversations that don't take place between us other than you standing there and me standing, sitting here. Oh, so now's your time. Well, no, we probably eventually will because uh, I still haven't heard from this, the uh, city attorney regarding the uh, violation of the Brown Act. So I'm tomorrow going to the district attorney and further, uh, the, further uh, my complaint against the city about the violation of the Brown Act, which, you know, I don't know how you can consider him a... A uh, good attorney if he doesn't even know the, whether or not you violated the Brown Act having this party at your house. But that's, you know. Do you really think it's appropriate for, for you or anyone else to use that lectern to, to come in and talk about people that way? Do you it's think that's how it should be done? It's absolutely appropriate for me. Because you can? It's, it's absolutely appropriate for me to come in, this, come in here on this lectern and question you or anybody else in this council. Well, I'm answering your questions now. Who's going to ask me? Who's doing something wrong? Absolutely, it's appropriate for me or anybody else to come up here and do that. You know, Listen, not getting three minutes of fame, I'm getting the three minutes of fame at other people's expense. I, I, could, not care, I could care less about fame. I'm not into this. To get on the front page of the paper, I don't care less. I could see that. I could see that when you took the banner and, and showed it to everybody. Yeah, you know, why am I here and waste our time on a city, a city that is in crisis, a city that I, I absolutely wish all four council members could work together on. We're, we're a city that is drying up. The if water is literally... Let me finish now. I'll let you finish. Hey, go ahead. The water is drying up, right? The, the growth will stop. The, water. The, the jobs will leave. There are crises facing this city that require five people to work together. And we got people like you, like you, that want to stir the pot, get recalls going, meeting with Mr. Cilio, meeting with Mr. Mann for the purpose of doing that, when there's not even an issue present that would justify such a thing. Excuse and there's a lot of people that want to jump on board. Well, I'm telling you, this is our city, and we do not have time for that nonsense anymore. And yes, if that occurs, if any member of this council acts in a way that is disruptive to the growth and development and safety of this city, there is a mayor that will take action. Okay. I have never met. Is that Mr. clear enough? I have never met with Mr. Celio and Mr. Mann regarding uh, a recall of any sort, of any kind. That is an absolute lie. It is not. We have pictures of them at the recall meeting with you last time. No, I'm the last I'm recall. Last your recall. picture was in the paper with Mr. Celio. I'm not talking about the last recall. I'm talking about the one now that will probably take place in Mr. Smith because of what he did in the last election. Well, good luck with that. Okay. Thank you. Come on up. Mr. Mayor, thank you and the council for the opportunity to speak tonight, particularly as I see a beautiful sign that says, In God We Trust. That's wonderful. Another quick statement on behalf of our city attorney. I have 18 years with him, and I'll bet on him any day. He's the best I know. I'm thankful for that. I also want to say to you, Mr. Mayor, and to the council, thank you all for inviting me to be a part of the 4th of July celebration, and, and not only that, having an opportunity to come and sit in the booth and to speak with you all. It was a great joy to me, and I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Smith, I just hope that you will keep up the good work and not even let your head turn to the left nor to the right, as you know what the Bible says. Go straight ahead. I think you're doing an absolute wonderful job, 
and the years that you and I served together, I will never forget it. It's absolutely wonderful. You're great. I'll stand up for you as long as I have legs to stand on. You just need to know that. The last thing I want to talk about, which is really what I came to talk about, is a violent free zone. I have a partner here with me, and we came to do business tonight, and if you all treat us wrong, we'll, uh, we'll come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I've already talked to, uh, some time ago, to, to our city manager. We just hope that the city of Lancaster will also uh, come forth and uh, support the violent free zone uh, here in the city of Lancaster, Eastside High School, and uh, the uh, Pete Knight High School tonight had a absolute uh, show and tell story about the benefit of the violent free zone movement. So four and a half years ago, uh, I brought this. Uh, four and a half months ago, sorry, uh, that I brought this to the council and uh, the city and council at that time 100% uh, supported it. And I think it's been a great value to us, a great value to the community, and it's going to make a difference in the learning system that we have in the city of Lancaster. So I would urge you all to do everything you can to meet that requirement uh, and uh, make sure that we support the violent free zone movement. Mrs. Wynn, who is on the board of directors there for the uh, uh, Alabama Valley Union High School District, and we've been talking about it. So, Mr. Mayor and Council, hope that you will support that. Thank you so much for my opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Bishop. And by the way, I have second or two left. <laughs> Ms. Mr. Mayor, may I take his second or two? <laughs> you know, as you can see, I, I'm pretty loose with all this. <laughs> Um, as I might remind the audience and, and uh, Mayor Hearns, the council did in the uh, current budget, budget $75,000 for that program to match funds of the school district. So there is money in the budget if the school district were to also fund the program. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Wynn, did you have anything? I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Were you at the walk with the mayor? I wasn't there. Good. Did it go good? Okay. Uh, Ms. Goss? First of all, I'd like to tell you how much of an inconvenience this was. I had to get up at 4 o'clock this morning in order to leave work an hour early so that I could be here. And then I put in my card and I find everybody else who put in their card after me spoke before me. So I apologize. Okay. Of course, I'm back to the bottleneck on Avenue L and 60th Street. As you can see, this blue is Lancaster-owned road and it's a big huge bottle four lanes and then it goes down for almost two miles it's owned by unincorporated LA County and it's a single lane and then it goes back and it becomes Lancaster and then there's a smidgen here that becomes unincorporated LA County and then this piece becomes unincorporated LA County and this one becomes Palmdale and all of this is one lane and if you put commercial there you can destroy us there is no way the traffic that can handle it right now. And these are figures from the National Institute of Traffic Engineers. And they have figures for a super center store of 200,000 square feet. And the one proposed on this particular corner is, I believe, 208,000 square feet. And they have weekend average traffic is 10,847 vehicles. This is through the whole week. The week includes the school days. So you have all the school traffic converging there. You're going to add this on. It does not include all the other little stores that are going to be put in this supposed area. It does not include the trucks. And as you know, Walmart and Target don't truck pull. Neither does McDonald's or Burger King. None of them truck pull. All of these stores are going to have daily traffic because they're bringing in fresh produce and food. So there's no way. So if this is the vehicle count, you add on the traffic for the diesel truck delivery, and you add on 
the school traffic and you add on the residence traffic, there's no way this single lane road can handle this traffic. And then on the other corner, you've got 108,000 square foot super target and a weekday traffic says 3,386 vehicles. And then you have a Home Depot type store and a weekday traffic is 3,460 vehicles. There's no way a single lane is going to be able to handle this kind of traffic. You put in as many lights as you want and you're just going to make our commute home worse. You're going to make the school kids and parents traffic worse. That's it. Uh, Ms. Goss, uh, come back. You put a lot of work into that. Thank you. Uh, and I would agree with you that if, if they left that a single lane, that'd be insanity. Yes, correct. Okay. But I appreciate the effort you put into that. Thank you. It, 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 for the first time, I now understand clearly what you've been saying. Well, because you wouldn't meet me on the corner to see this traffic. Well, so I had to bring. I gotta be at the park to walk. <laughs> well, I invited you twice. That's right. You did, but you scared me, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mayor, just to. The same admonition I've been making for six, eight, ten, twelve months. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. The, the, this is very valuable information that is appropriately brought up during the hearing processes on the land use decisions that will be before you um, and on the EIR that will be before you um, at some point in the future. I'm not sure uh, when. but coming outside of that hearing process, it really is something that is not part of that record until it, it is incorporated into that record. So um, while she has every right to come and present this information to you at this point in time, I just want to make sure that it's not something that you would then consider at that time unless she comes back with the same same information. Ms. Goss, you're going to be back, aren't you? Of course. I have to sacrifice my vacation time and my sleep time to get here at and, and there are ways to, to submit all of that information in writing for consideration as well. Okay. Mrs. Gosh, you can't do it from there. You, you I, I just want to make sure that, you know, that everybody understands that you don't have okay. to be here in person to submit that and make sure it's, it's in the record for consideration. Okay. Thank you. I'm getting these all mixed up. Is it fear? Fear? Fear. Oh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Vernon. My name is Vernon Fear, and I live in Lancaster. Paris Mayor, City Councils, Council Members, City. Uh, my subject is on the American Flag uh, Amendment. I take an excerpt from the American Legion, the magazine for a strong America, July 2008. The U.S. Flag Code is a federal law providing rules for proper display, treatment, and respect for old glory. No committee of Congress has sole authority over the flag. No government agency controls its place in society. There are no flag police. The U.S. Flag Code essentially belongs to the people, and its enforcement is most often conducted through our education. The code has been modified many times over the years, including 2008. When military personnel and veterans are given the authority to salute the flag, even when in, not in uniform, a change to the Section 9 of the Flag Code written into the Defense Authorization Act this year now gives veterans and members of the U.S. Armed Forces the authority to render a salute of the flag, whether in or out of uniform. I am a veteran, and I'm proud to say that I can salute that flag. I spent my time during the Korean War. I had good times and unpleasant times. They helped protect my country. But now I salute this flag for two reasons. One is because I have that right. And the other is because somebody's defending my rights now. They're young children. At least to me they are. And when I hear about their deaths, it hurts me because I need it. I had a few unpleasant experiences. But I'm 77 years old and those young men and women are protecting my rights now. So when I salute, it's for the flag and for them, and it's my right to do it. Thank you. Uh, council members, you city managers, 
I think you're doing a, well, a good job. You have some crucial subject to talk about. And Mr. Smith, keep up the good work. And if I may, I'd like to talk to you after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Vernon. You know, Vernon has figured out a way so that not one drop of water goes onto the street or the sidewalk. And it took you quite a bit of effort to do that, didn't it? Yes, sir. But I it, made some comments about that, Smith. But it's doable, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Paul. Mr. Mayor and Council members, again, we're here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for the 4th of July. I had come last time and complained, and the enforcement was excellent. Captain Anderson, thank you. Second of all, I brought you a couple of pictures. Um, I really enjoyed my walk with the mayor time. My sons did as well. And uh, you have that one cute picture of you two doing push-ups, so that, that was a fun moment. Um, the other picture, the added one up there, is to remind you why you're mayor. Those other seven guys weren't elected, so uh, I thought you might like that. And uh, the, other one, <laughs> the other one, of course, is, is the Noah costume, which uh, we can take around and knock on doors. But I really thoroughly enjoyed the walk in the park, and my boys did. And it was uh, pretty hard to keep up with you. I had to lag behind, but then I had the pleasure of walking and talking with your mother, and that was a very good time. So thank you for everything, and thank you for the 4th of July enforcement. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Paul. You doctored this picture. I'm not that fat. Sheila <laughs> uh, Rowlett. Did I pronounce that right? Rowlett? Rowlett? How do you pronounce it? What? Okay. Mr. Mayor, council members, and uh, residents of Lancaster like myself, I have a really direct and pointed question, and that is, where can I get crime statistics on gangs? I've tried online. I can't find them. Uh, I'll put this in a framework. I'm a sociologist and I recently returned to Lancaster from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I'm studying gangs. I, I'm really interested in finding out about gangs and, and doing a comparative analysis with Belfast. Well, over in Belfast, I'm able to get crime statistics easily on the differences in crimes, the, the rate of crime, and I'll just uh, explain to you what I what I mean. I want I want to know what the recorded crime is, and I want to know uh, what the overall crime record is. I want to know about violent crime, burglary, theft. I, I want all those statistics, but I don't know how to get a hold of them. I don't know where to go, and I'm here today to ask you. Where can I get them? Do I go to the sheriff's office? Uh, are they? Is there a kind of a? a is there a, a report that has this this kind of uh, information on record that I can go in and get? Is there a, an annual report to do comparisons on, say, last year to this year to find out if the crime rate has gone up and down? The reason I want this is to have a framework in order to do my research and so if I don't have statistics I don't know what's going on in the community and so I, I just I've, I've searched high and low and I've asked several people if there's any record uh, if there is an annual report on crime statistics and, and no one seems to know and so I'm here today to ask you directly if I, if your statistics are transparent and if the public has access to the statistics. And that's, and that's it. 
That's what I'm asking. She comes on the walk with the mayor, so I've gotten a chance to know her, and I've also read her work. Uh, she, she's real. I mean, she, she knows her stuff. She's, she's incredibly bright. But even if you weren't, you should be able to get those statistics. And so we, we, we will, the, the city manager will work with you to get what's available now. I can tell you that in a very short period of time, there will be a, a screen in the city manager's office. There will be a screen in my office that will pinpoint every gang activity in the city. It will pinpoint every parolee in the city. It will pinpoint the crimes as they occur. It is something we are going to watch daily. Uh, we, we will, I think we now have the technology. We have to put the screens up, and then we have to work with our criminal uh, statistics person to make that happen. But in a very short period of time, this city will have the, the, the most sophisticated statistics on crime in our offices, in front of our face, every day, so that we never forget that our primary goal in this city is to make it safe and get rid of those gangs. And so as, a new, as any new gang member comes in, the moment he's identified, I'm going to know where he lives, the city manager is going to know where he lives, and the captain of the sheriff's department is going to know where he lives. And when crimes start happening around there, that's the first place we're going to go. Uh, you know, you're kind of a breath of fresh air because of your experience with the statistics. I think you're going to be astonished, and you're going to be able to help us a great deal with, with what we're doing. But the scientific crime enforcement is coming to the Antelope Valley, whether these gang members like it or not. Okay? Yes, well, I'd just like to make a closing comment. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, being from Belfast, Northern Ireland, they have to have very accurate statistics there to categorize the paramilitary problem in relationship to general crime. And I think it would be fantastic if you could categorize uh, gang-related crime in relationship to general crime, it would give people who are doing research an idea on who to target. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank and I, I look forward to working with you. Okay, I think that's it. Ah, uh, somebody else wants one more? Did you want to come up? Sure. Come on up. Of course, he's going to get mad at me again. You know that. He's, he's going to yell at me for inviting people up to talk like that. <laughs> okay. I guess I'll just fill this out afterwards and put it in. Um, it's, very, it's very interesting what she was talking about, gangs and all that stuff. Um, I work at the prison. I'm a correctional officer. And um, I'm also involved in uh, what's known as a CROP program. It's convicts reaching out to people. And it's an excellent, it's an excellent program. It's kind of like scared straight, but they don't yell and scream at them when they get them in there. Um, the thing that concerns me too is on being, from being on the inside and knowing what goes on with um, the guys in there. Matter of fact, it's a, it's the prison at, on at Lancaster State Prison is where I work, so they're all guys. Um, it's great to know where these parolees are and stuff like that, but. My concern is also it's it's very tough. Granted, they you know committed the crime, you know they did their time when they get out and on parole. But my concern is also for them. It's very difficult being a parolee. Okay, I mean I, I've had a lot of them talk to me and tell me I don't know what I'm going to do when I get out. They have no family, they have no friends, no way, no source of income, and then they have the community looking at them like you know just waiting for them to screw up. And so I, I don't want to see that happen to them. I want to see them to be able to get into back into the community, get integrated in. And uh, granted, I know it's going to be a trust a trust issue with them, but I don't I don't want them to be the scapegoat for maybe what goes on in that particular area. I understand what you're saying, and I don't have a problem with that. But just be careful, because it's hard enough on them as it is. Um, there's also a liaison. Um, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name right now, that the warden just hired um, to go between the community to help out with integration of the, um, the prisoners into the community. And uh, I think it's going to be a really fantastic thing. It, it uh, has them uh, learning vocational skills, stuff like that. But we also we told him, we said, you need to start that before 
they go out there, so they get into that mentality and they start working for that. Um, but I mean, I can let you know how that's going and where it's going, and uh, I, I think that'll be a great benefit. And then you don't have to worry so much about the parolees and what they're doing, and you know, we can integrate them back into society, and they'll be productive members of society, and the recidivism won't be a factor anymore. That's that's what our goal is anyway, and also to educate the kids to help them. I think if if we put more money into instead of putting police officers on the streets, more money into programs for our kids and helping them to, you know, get uh, involved in things that matter, even in things in the community, to make them feel like they're worth something, it, it would be far more, it, the money would be much better spent in doing something like that. So, my time's up. <laughs> you know, I, I I, I appreciate what you what you have to say. It bothers me a great deal that I am as I don't like that part of myself that feels like these people should be targeted. But I do. I think that these parolees are dangerous, and and I wish the the federal government and the state government would use their might to do something about rehabilitating these people because I honestly believe people can be rehabilitated mm -hmm. I, I think I'm an example of that in many ways but the parolee that comes out of that state prison is a target and if he stays in Lancaster he's our target and if he screws up once we want to come down on him like a ton of bricks and, and if there's some way we could get the message to these guys don't come to Lancaster be, because we are fed up and I know how unfair that is to the individual and I know that there's individual people that are going to be treated unjustly and unfairly and in that part of me it bothers me that I'm willing to do that but I, I think Just that be fair. I think we're at the tipping point That's now, and I don't know that that we can be concerned for the parolee that comes to Lancaster. When we when we see what's happening to our community and when we see what's happening to our children, there there comes a point when you reach the no mercy stage. Well, it's not so much that the parolee comes to Lancaster. If this is where they committed their crime, that's where they go back to parole. So that's incorrect. It's the county. It's not the city. Okay. Well, I, what what we've experienced they dump them out down there. That's right. Is we don't we get we get more than our share. You know, I I think we could handle our share. I think if we only had our share, we could develop programs to reintegrate the the people that really want to to be rehabilitated. But we're not getting our share. We're getting much more than that. So maybe the answer is in the kids before that all happens. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. City Manager? City Clerk? No other announcements. That was the speaker's card. Okay, ready. Okay. Any additional comments from the council members? There's a report. Oh, this is a report. The council reports. I think uh, Council Larry Marcus has a report on the. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, they, they didn't give me my uh, cue cards. I just wanted to give a, a couple of points on the Section 8 committee that's being formed. Um, I've met with the city manager, and city manager and the city attorney are working on an ordinance to address some of the issues we've discussed with Section 8, and I won't go into all that again tonight. And other issues such as excessive calls for law enforcement uh, services, we've already talked about that, an ordinance that um, Councilman Ron Smith brought up. And this should be before the council in September, if not sooner. Um, the city manager and the staff have met with Palmdale staff to discuss, discuss a cooperation effort on local control of Section 8 and administration of it regionally. Um, Mr. Bozegan has informed me that the council should have a proposal to us in August, I believe is what he said, uh, to jointly fund with Palmdale to hire a specialist in this area to help us to... Um, and analyze it and have a roadmap to know where we're going for greater uh, control. 
Also, the staff is preparing a brochure. It's going to be something like how to be a good neighbor. Um, I don't know if this is going to be mailed or, or how exactly it's going to be. Okay. And then um, I believe that's key. Just as uh, what was discussed tonight, I was thinking about the potholes. If you've got potholes and you don't have anybody that calls them in, then things happen to good people. The same thing has to happen with Section 8 violations, um, code enforcement violations, graffiti on the walls, uh, shopping carts. We've all got to get on the phones and make those appropriate phone calls and take care of this because the Sheriff's Department, code enforcement, they can't do it all themselves. We've got to be their eyes and ears. Um, and let me take a moment just to brag on the staff. Since I've uh, been here at the, the city and City Hall, I'm very impressed with the professionalism and the can-do spirit. Uh, the city managers do an outstanding job, and I believe, I really believe that the staff, the city staff, is excited about um, where we're going, the direction we're going, and uh, also. Um, I think that Mayor Paris and the council members, the unity that we've shown in a short period of time, I think that that has really encouraged the city of Lancaster, and I appreciate all that. Um, I'm excited about the solutions that we're going to find to the challenges that we have here in Lancaster and um, working together. And finally, let me say to Mayor Paris and the council members, I want to thank you and the staff as well, and those people that donated to the In God We Trust, the artwork that was put up with the seal. Um, I think it's beautiful. And um, I want to really thank Greg at Signs and Designs that did an outstanding job and, and got, those, uh, get, got it ordered and got it up for us. And I appreciate that. And um, I just want to say I'm very thankful to be an American. And uh, I hope that everyone did have a fabulous 4th of July, which was our 232nd birthday for our nation. And uh, God bless America. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, I wasn't going to say anything, but... Oh, come on, let's get it out. Sure. <laughs> well, you mentioned my name tonight. Uh, no, I, I think Mr. Pelka did first, and I responded. He did. Okay. Um, just a reminder that you and I did have a meeting the day you were sworn in, and in that meeting we decided that our differences would be not be personal, would be strictly issue related. No, you were going to get back to me on that. On that one? That's what I thought. No, I thought we were pretty straightforward on that one. Okay. Well, you just never got back to me. Yeah. That's a couple hours we beat that horse. Okay. Since that time, I've read in the paper that you don't like me and I don't like you, and I don't remember making that statement, but apparently that's how you feel. And today I read on a local blog that one of your campaign workers is making some false and baseless allegations about me. I've been out of town, I'm in a trial down in L.A., and I haven't looked at the blogs for four days. I have an opening argument I have to do in the morning, and when I leave here, I'm going back to my, my apartment in L.A., and I'll be preparing that opening. So whether or not I have a campaign worker that is talking about you, it has nothing to do with me or my campaign. I haven't talked to them about that. What I have to say to you, I'll say from this dais, and I'll say to Mr. Wilson in the press, and I'll say it on the walk. I do not think that the two of you are working as hard as you should be working to solve the problems of this city. I think what you're doing is you're meeting with people uh, like Mr. Pelka for the purposes of playing political power games. And if that occurs, I'm telling you right now, I will respond. We are here to save this city. You can worry about your political power base later. I'm not going to be mayor very long, but during that time, I am not going to let you and your, your political friends turn this city into a game one more time. The, the, the 60 days that I've been mayor, I've yet to see you propose one thing to help this city in, the, in moving in the direction it should move. And that goes to both of you. 
Not one motion, not one program, not one plan. And if you think that I'm going to sit here and, and not say what I mean and not say what I think, you're wrong. I think you could be working a lot harder to helping this city reach its goals. Can I say it any clearer? And it doesn't matter if I like you. And it doesn't matter if you like me. I work with a lot of people I don't like for a common goal and for the common good. I'm not seeing that with you two. I'm seeing nonsense about blogs. Why don't you come to me about something about the water situation? Or why don't you come to me and tell me what you've done with Mrs. Marquez, uh, Marcus about how to deal with this Section 8 problem? You know, where is the courage? Where, where is the courage where you stand up and say, hey, folks, your lawn's going to have to die if you don't turn back the water? I don't see it. What I see is maybe a little cheerleading going on, but I, I have two council members that bust their butts every week, and I have two that I never see. And that's what's going on. Should I keep it a secret? Should I play politics with you? Should I worry about offending your friends because they might recall me? You got the wrong man for that. I really don't care if you're offended. And I don't care if your political friends are offended. And, and I don't care what you write on the blogs or read on the blogs. What I care about is, why don't you help us get rid of these gangs? Why don't you, why don't you stand up and tell the Section 8 people, yes, we know it might be politically unpopular in some circles that we attack the Section 8 problems in this city, but we're going to do it anyway. I don't see that from you. And until I do, I, I don't have a lot of use for you. Can I finish my comment now? You absolutely can. Thank you. I guess the comments that uh, Councilmember Mann and I make have served no useful purpose to you because you have your three votes. Well, show me the comment. Oh, these folks come here every week and they wait to hear one. They wait to hear a motion that you put out on the table and say, let's do this. You know, I'm not the only one waiting. What, what, uh, what, you know, you really think I'm going to sit here and wait for your recall? I'm not. Section 8, we have a council member you've appointed to be the Section 8 czar, and you've also appointed one as a water czar, and they're running with that. I suspect that you'll never appoint myself or Ken as a member or a, to lead a task force on any important issue. And the difference is, you see, they come and ask. They come and tell me that this is an appropriate plan, this is something that we can accomplish. You're right. I am not going to just give it to somebody who I have not seen the effort put forward to do something. You know, it, it, it's, it, we're representing 140,000 people. It, it, it shouldn't be a situation I have to come to you. You know, we got a council of three. I would like a council of five, but I'm not going to pay, play lip service to it. I want to see it. I want to pay attention to what you're doing, not what you say. I don't think anything I say is going to make a bit of difference. Oh, come on. First of all, 140,000 people are going to make sure that it makes a difference if it makes sense. You've got a microphone, you've got a position, you've got the ability to lead. Lead, or get out of my way. I'll just close with this, that um, apparently you have the impression that I meet with people on a regular basis to engineer your or another council member's downfall. If that's the case, and if that's an accusation to make, we have a code of ethics and a code of conduct. Make an accusation in that forum. Vernon, I'm sorry. Uh, if I were to do that, would it be really unfair to the other people who want to? Okay. With that, I'm done. I don't think anyone else here wants to really listen to our public bickering. Well, you know, actually, you're supposed to listen to our public bickering because if we do it in the back room, that's called a violation of the Brown Act. You know? Uh, I'm just telling you what I feel. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it behind your back. I'm not going to have a campaign worker put it on the blog. I'll say it. It's the truth. Change it. And as soon as you change it, I'll apologize. And as soon as you change it, I'll put you guys on commissions. I'll let you lead task force, but I got to see leadership first.
what, I'm, what, I, what I don't want to see is I start a task force on Section 8, then nothing happens. You know, that's what government normally does. Normally, government gets the headline, and then nothing happens. I've got other lives to live. I'm not going to be mayor for 10 years. We've got work to do now. And you're welcome to join me. Well, but you are not welcome to get in my way. Other than two votes, one I was thinking, one I opposed to, thought we were on the same page on the issues. I don't want people on the same page with me on issues. I want people working. I want people leading. I want people joining in and attacking these problems with the vitality that is necessary for us to prevail. And that doesn't happen when we start playing politics with people and trying to, to, to stir the pot with people. That's the We've got, we've got a staff here that's devoted their life to this city, and I think they are mal-served. That's the accusation I keep hearing, that, we're, that I'm playing politics. And if you can show an example of that since the day you were elected, I'd like to see it. I will be happy to put that in print. Are we done? Oh. Man, you want to get in this? <laughs> My mother told me to make sure that when you open up your mouth and you have something to say to make sure it's appropriate. I suspect we could get into a bicker and debate. Um, if you go to my website, <clears throat> I appreciate all the work that's been done in the first 60 days because I think that on the campaign, uh, I spoke in regards to making sure that we make the right moves in regards to getting more law enforcement. <clears throat> and I felt that water should be addressed. And I can recall in the beginning when we were on the campaign trail, whether it was you or it was Ms. Marquez, um, Marcus. I, or Marcus, um, I believe that it was more or less a, a one-road show. In other words, the concern from what was spoken out in the public's eye was that uh, we had a problem with crime in the city. And there was even some discussion that maybe the water problem was a sham. And, and now I think that some people have gotten into office and uh, they see that those items are, are real important. I can recall that uh, the water czar sitting to the left of me last fall me made a recommendation. I'm, I'm not a czar. Okay. It was the vice mayor. The vice mayor uh, actually made a comment or actually made a motion to, uh, to bring two projects before the city that would have used an enormous amount of water. So um, I appreciate you, you sitting there. Mr. Mayor, because everything that I hoped and dreamed for as a city councilman, you've moved it right along, and whether or not I'm the, the new czar or I'm not, I'm still part of the five vote, and I appreciate that. So um, right now, I'll continue to, to sit back and let you ride the show. And I, I appreciate your vote, and I appreciate your support, and quite honestly, I need more than that. I need you to work. I need you to come up with ideas. I need you to be productive. I need you to stop, or, or when you hear the, the nonsense that's going on on the blogs and things of that nature, that you step away from it and that you start leading this city with this. And leadership requires you to do more than be a cheerleader when it is politically uh, advantageous to be one. Leadership requires that you take some risks. That, you know, guess what? These folks may not like it when we turn down their water. These, these folks may not like it when we start kicking Section 8 people out of this community. You know, I'm sure that Ms. Morgan doesn't like the idea that I am targeting parolees. It's unpopular in many circles to do that. But, but when you're leading a city, that's what it takes. It takes being unpopular. And I'd like to see you get into this unpopular game a little bit and lead us out of this mess. Because it is, it is, it, if you all think that I've got all the answers in my head and I'm going to come up with it, that's not going to happen. It's going to take people like Darren Parker, and Darren and I have not been friends in the past, have we? Uh, it, it requires people of different political persuasion to come together and make things happen. And that's all I'm suggesting to you guys. You start doing that, and on my walks with the mayor, I'll start singing your praises. But don't expect it until then.
Can we go home now, or do you want to say anything else? Everybody good? Yes, sir. Go ahead. It's probably going to be a mistake. I mean, right now I get all the bad headlines. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, uh, Council Member Mann, you're factually incorrect. And if you want to ever have a public debate on what I did or what I didn't do, I'll do it. But do not make any statements about what I've done or not done. If you want to, as Mr. Silver said, if you think I've done something different, you want to put it on the agenda, we'll discuss it. If you want to go on AVT today and have a debate about it, any day of the week. Okay? That's, that's improper. Um, I wanted to say about the In God We Trust. You know, th there's a lot of heated debate here tonight on certain things. I don't always like it. I don't always think that some of it's appropriate, but it, it happens. It's part of politics. You know, as Council uh, Member Marcus had said, and it makes me think about about 232 years ago, there was a group of men that argued someone wanted to duel each other. I don't want to duel them. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, as we look up here and we put this and we put this up here as our national motto, we just had the Fourth of July. I had my hot dogs and my ice cream and my barbecue and um, changed my clothes for the barbecue for the Fourth of July uh, uh, ceremony. Um, but 232 years ago, there was a group of men in a hot on a hot day that decided to sign their death warrant. based that God had given them the unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that it was evident that all men were created equal. And I think sometimes we need to take a step back and realize what they did, because we wouldn't be here today having these discussions and, and having these heated arguments if it wasn't for that. And uh, sometimes we get, you know, with the fireworks and the... Uh, and the uh, hot dogs and all that fun. But, you know, Fourth of July and seeing this up here, it just means a lot to me, and I just had to say that. So, thank you. Thank you. And uh, was it the Parks Department that put in the Fourth of July, I think? You, you guys did an amazing job. That was the best Fourth I've been to. I, I, I just can't tell you how well run, how how flawless that, that went. You did start a fire, though. <laughs> That's not the first time. No. And, it, and you did it with legal fireworks. You, know, you kind of made me look bad there, you know? <laughs> All right. Thank you. And, and I'm sorry if I stress anybody out. We cleared the air. I think everybody knows. You'll all read about it tomorrow. I guess not tomorrow. I'll be Thursday. I'll be out of town, so I don't have to read it. And uh, you all tell me how bad it sounded, would you? Thank you. You know, I, I appreciate being your mayor. I hope that we're taking you in the direction that you want to go. Thanks.